Okay. Shalom and welcome to the European Report. Uh, here we are in the European Parliament, in the heart of the European Union, and in today's programme we'll be discussing the latest European Court's ruling on Israeli goods and products produced in Judea and Samaria, East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights in a boost to the BDS. Now, in this programme I'm joined by Thomas Sandel, the founder and director of the European Coalition for Israel, as well as uh, Caroline Stadler, who's an Austrian MEP, and uh, Gregory Lafitte, who is the uh, ECI's UN advisor or director. So welcome to the program. Uh, Thomas, I'll, I'll start off with you. It's uh, great to have you back on the program. So if you want to share with our viewers some of the activities that you've been involved in on behalf of Israel and the Jewish people since you were last on the program last month. Thank you, Simon. Pleasure. And um, I'd like to share very briefly two things that have happened since we, we last met in the, in the program. Uh, immediately after the recording of our last European report, I flew to Jerusalem. Uh, and I was there for Sukkot, which is a very special experience, I think. And it's the first time I've been there for, for Sukkot. Uh, it means that you can't have many official meetings because, you know, government is, is closed down. But it, uh, it uh, shows such an interesting part of Jewish life and everything stops in a way. And, and I think the Jewish people are very good at, at celebrating and, and knowing to have a good time. And uh, it was so special for me to be there and to be able to speak at, uh, at a few conferences uh, as well. Let me also mention that uh, uh, two weeks ago I was in Sanremo, Italy, and many of our viewers will, will recognize that this city is, is really connected with the history of the Jewish people in a, in a particular way. And we are now planning the centennial in, oh, in April uh, together with the, the city of Sanremo, together with the Israeli government. Uh, ba basically to uh, remember two things. One is a, a celebration of the fact that uh, the, the right uh, of the Jewish people for a national home in Palestine was recognized already 100 years ago next year under international law. Um, the second um, thing is more a solemn commemoration because as we know, if this promise would have been kept and, and uh, kept in time, we could have uh, saved so many precious Jewish lives. Say if there would have been a Jewish state already in 1938 instead of 1948, just imagine how many Jewish people would, would still be, be around. So this is a very important uh, anniversary. Absolutely. As a journalist, I know that uh, uh, these centennials are so important in uh, in terms of getting a message across. And mm -hmm. if you miss this centennial, we have to wait another 100 years. I'm not <laughs> sure I will still be around. So it's, it's going to be very special. Excellent. Thank you so much. And uh, Caroline, uh, welcome to the program. It's uh, your first uh, representative from uh, Austria on the program. So it's a pleasure having you on the program. But you also, you've got a really compelling and interesting story of how the issue of anti-Semitism became personal for you. So can you share with this this very personal story of yours? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It gives me the possibility to talk about anti-Semitism and I think we all are aware of the problem that it is definitely on the rise. Mm -hmm. So we have to do something against it. And for me personally, um, this is a very long story why I am dealing with this um, topic since years in the meantime. Uh, it is a long story, but I l would like to put it short. Uh, it dates back 25 years. It was uh, when we had an excursion from um, the school to the synagogue in Austria, in Salzburg. And it was Marco Feingold at that time, who was the rabbi there. And um, he died this year on the 19th September 2019 at the age of 106. Amazing. So, and 25 years ago, ago, you can imagine, it was an old man for me, but mm. he became much older and a fascinating person. And I started to learn and read about anti-Semitism, about Israel, about the dispute between Palestinians and Israelis. And then I had the great luck in my life that I was working as a judge at the, at the court in Salzburg, regional court. And then I changed and moved to the Ministry of Justice. And I was also responsible for dealing with uh, the Jewish community. Several cases are at the court and we always tried to get them along uh, with a clear message that anti-Semitism is not a question. So we have to fight against all forms of this. And then I was working at the European Court of Human Rights and also in this regard I had to deal with uh, judgments where you had to decide is it the freedom of expression or 
are some other human rights harmed by some things which were posted. And in the end, before I became a member of the European Parliament and I, am, I have the honor to chair the Working Group on Antisemitism here, Absolutely. I was State Secretary in Austria and in this regard I was also responsible for the former concentration camp of Mauthausen. I always tried to bring it to young people. We have to be aware of the mm. darkest hours, uh, the darkest chapters in our history. And I think the key mm. to fight antisemitism is education mm -hmm. and is to bring young people young people's awareness to, to this topic. I had the great honor, and for this, it's really compelling for my story. I had the great honor to have a discussion with Marco Feingold at the age, he was then 104 years old, oh, wow. with 300 pupils in Salzburg. Wow. And I could really experience and feel how these young people were touched by his story. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean. Mm -hmm. We don't, we have to talk about facts, that's clear. We have to fight anti-Semitism in all its forms. But the most important thing is that we can get these young peoples and that they can feel the difference between living in the European Union in countries surrounded by friendly countries mm. or living in Israel, mm -hmm. where the security issue is at stake mm. on a daily basis and is lethal for all the people living there. So pleased uh, you're a member of this uh, parliament. I'm sure you can have a big impact in terms of raising awareness of Jew hatred. And uh, so thank you so much for sharing your story. You. Uh, and Gregory, absolute pleasure to have you on the European Report. And I know that you do great work with uh, Thomas in, in the United Nations. Do you want to share a little bit about the work you do, but also your thoughts <coughs> on the European Court uh, of Justice decision to label Israeli produce from Judea and Samaria which is known as the West Bank, East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights, as in breach of international humanitarian law. Well, thank you. Thank you, Simon. It's, um, it's great to, uh, uh, to, to be back in, uh, in this program. It's been a long time, actually, I think. <laughs> I don't remember how many years, but um, and um, it's great to be here in, uh, in Brussels. Um, so our work at the United Nations is, is uh, um, uh, started very much in focusing on how can we fight this rise of anti-Semitism. And uh, uh, in the, the past years it has become unfortunately very clear that this rise is a reality and that we need to do everything we can to, to, to fight this. Um, so uh, unfortunately it's very much linked to our subject today, uh, to, to this ruling uh, which uh, um, I, I believe I, I'm, I'm no expert of international law, but uh, it's very clear that it's a, a unfair ruling, and um, I think that uh, um, we have to. Uh, I, I don't want to say outright that this it is anti-Semitic, but but it is true that it's quite a. a um, troubling to see that uh, uh, from all the, the, the different uh, disputes uh, here and there that this would be the only uh, one that would be uh, uh, addressed. Uh, and uh, um, so many things I think can be said about this, uh, this ruling and let's, um, let, let's hope that um, somehow it would be um, ignored. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and Thomas, um, the uh, Israeli Foreign Ministry have issued a very strong statement to the European Union um, by stating that the European Court of Justice decision that the entire, this is what they say, the entire ruling objective singled out Israel and has applied double standards against Israel. This is from the Israeli Foreign Ministry. Um, and they say that there are over 200 territorial disputes around the world, but the European Court has not ruled on any of them. Um, surely this does nothing to bring about peace and reconciliation between the Israelis and the Palestinians and only boost the BDS in the effort to delegitimize the state of Israel. Why do you believe that the European Court is ruling, out, ruling Israel out on this occasion? Well, if, if you look Sigma at the now. explanation from uh, uh, the European Court of, of Justice, um, I think there are more uh, uh, clear than... Because this goes back, of course, to, to 2015 when, when uh, the Commission came with their explanatory note on... Uh, on, on the labeling issues. Uh, uh, at that time, uh, it was said to be uh, a question of consumer information. When you, when you look at the explanation from the court, they go further <clears throat> and they, um, they explain in saying that, you know, they want to give all the information for the consumers so that they can make a decision based on their perception of, uh, of uh, to what extent this is a breach of international law or this is unethical. 
Um, and I think that this is um, a bit unfortunate because um, um, they are insinuating in a way by saying this is a clear breach of international law, it's, it's unethical, it's something which is uh, troubling, whereas my um, and, and uh, the point of European Coalition for Israel has always been to say that we need to promote cooperation, coexistence between Israelis and, and Palestinians. Uh, a very good way of doing this is through business. And as Shimon Peres once mm. said, he said, you know, us politicians, we often create problems. Business, business initiatives are very pragmatic. They solve problems. So um, as, as you may recall also that in the last program here with David Lega from, from Sweden, he said that in, in Sweden, 85% of, of the population, the view the domestic Jewish uh, um, uh, citizens through the prism of the conflict in the Middle East. So it means that uh, perceptions that the citizens are getting from uh, this ruling, from certain European Commission statements, which are insinuating that there are huge problems by um, Israeli companies providing job opportunities for Palestinians, Absolutely. is. Um, um, not, not perhaps on purpose, but, but the, the, the result is still that it is fueling uh, uh, a sense of suspicion towards the, to the, towards the Jewish uh, communities. So, um, um, of course, and when you look at timing, this, this court ruling came out exactly two days after the 81st anniversary of Kristallnacht. And, and uh, I would have uh, at least expected that they could have somehow waited a few months because for us who are concerned about the rise of anti-Semitism in, in Europe and also see the uh, historical pattern of labeling goods, labeling businesses with the Star of David, this brings to memory a very sad chapter of our history. Absolutely. Uh, and, and Caroline, we have representatives of the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria, and Judea is called the land of the Jews, and that's where the biblical heartland is of the nation of Israel. And they feel very much that they are underrepresented, particularly here in the European Union, where there seems to be a double standard, that the European Union has signed up to the international Holocaust definition on anti-Semitism, yet the European courts seem to be in breach of its own standards it signed up to. Um, can you maybe explain this contradiction uh, and what are your concerns with, the, uh, with this court decision? Well, first of all, I would not get, uh, go so far to say it's unfair or it's um, anti-Semitic, this judge, uh, judgment. Uh, having been a former judge, I, I would like to really clearly state that, first of all, unfairness is not a category in, in jurisdiction because every court rules on the basis of law, mm -hmm. international law in the case of the European Court of Justice, and secondly, a court only rules if there is an application lodged. And mm -hmm. it was already mentioned, there is also for me, no, uh, I do not know about any other rulings on uh, territories which are under disputes, mm -hmm. but that's also because obviously nobody lodged an application to the court. Okay. So we, we have the first ruling on a territory dispute in this case. Mm -hmm. And um, you mentioned it also, the anti-Semitism definition is really a major step in history and it had already a huge impact that we have it, so we can measure it. But mm -hmm. we have to survive the situation. Now, if there is another, dis uh, in another ruling or another judgment mm -hmm. on a dispute, in a territory dispute, then we have to line out if it is anti-Semitic or not. Now we have a judgment mm -hmm. based on, on law. And I would not say that, it, that this is unfair or anti-Semitic, but we have to survive the situation. And let me give, us, uh, give you one example. For example, we have the situation at Krim, the occupied area of Krim. Mm -hmm. There we have a full ban of any import. So this part of a ruling, there is no ruling from, from any court, but you can't import any things from there. So I would not go that far and I would really like to reiterate that this definition helps us in bringing things forward that we know um, of what we are talking. And when it comes to BDS, I clearly disclaim this movement because you, we have to draw a line between criticism, <coughs> that is okay, 
but criticism mm -hmm. always must be objective. Mm -hmm. And if criticism harms other human rights, for example, we have the expression of, mm -hmm. of, um, uh, of media and, and that's, everything is clear. But criticism has to stay objective. Mm -hmm. And that's what this uh, anti Semitic uh, the, the definition of anti Semitism also says. Mm -hmm. And PDS is clearly out of this range, in, in, in my mm -hmm. point of view, mm -hmm. because it's only criticism because it's Israel. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then it becomes a problem. Sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, and Gregory, I mean, your, your experience in the uh, United Nations, um, here we are in the heart of the European Union, um, seem to have a, a different policy when it comes to, to Israel, which they consider Israel proper prior, Israel prior to the Six Day War and the, the Green Lines of 1967, mm -hmm. and uh, the s disputed territories. Um, can you see where the problem lies between, between the two? And, and why are they singling out Israel and only accepting Israel uh, prior to the 1967 borders, and yet there's completely different rules applied to Judea and Samaria, for example? I think the problem is this singling out. Um, you can't, uh, and, and it's true that, uh, and I'm not saying that uh, uh, qualifying this ruling as being anti Semitic. Uh, 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 not at all, but it is troubling to be to single out Israel uh, every time on, on a number of subjects. Uh, you, you mentioned the United Nations that the United Nations this singling out is is is, is constant. Is yeah. is a, 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 there's a, a the UN should be working on on a number of issues, uh, and the General Assembly committees are are just. Uh, 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 occupied all the time by, by this the subject of uh, of singling out uh, uh, Israel. So I think that that's where the, the um, th that's why I believe it's it's uh, somehow linked to anti-Semitism because um, if you if you try to understand what is anti-Semitism, uh, then then you realize that it starts by by presenting Israel and the Jewish people as being different from from all the others. Um, you, if I can make a, 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 a remark, um, you mentioned that Judea is the land of the Jews, and uh, um, and it's true that you know linguistically uh, Judea, uh, uh, you know Yehudi uh, meaning Jewish. Uh, it's interesting to see that the first moment uh, uh, in history and in the Bible where where anti-Semitism is really presented, this this singling out, is in the the, the scroll of Esther talking about uh, uh, the the Jews. And it's interesting that it talks about this, this Jewish person, Mordechai, saying that he's Yehudi, being Jewish, but Yehudi means of the tribe of Judah, and Mordechai is of the tribe of Benjamin. So it, it tells you a little bit of, uh, of something of really what anti-Semitism is. And it's, it's, it's really this always, uh, 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 this presentation of the Jews and this, the Jewish state as being different, different from all others. So that, that I think that that's where the problem lies. And it is troubling to have such a ruling at a time when when we see this this uh, 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 this rise of anti-Semitism once again. Yeah. Uh, and Thomas I had uh, the privilege of uh, being in Israel two weeks ago on invited on behalf of the Christian Media Summit that was organised by the Israeli Government Press Office. And uh, as part of that tour, we, we visited um, uh, Barak Khan uh, Industrial Unit, which mm -hmm. is very close to some of the Jewish settlements there. So these factories actually employ, they have 60 factories, they employ over 9,000 Palestinian workers. Those Palestinian workers are paid three times the salary of anyone working within the Palestinian Authority. And yet this ruling puts in jeopardy those Israeli factories and those jobs, uh, which is helping the peace process, which is helping peace and reconciliation uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians. What damage do you think this will have on the, this ruling will have on the Palestinian economy and more importantly on ordinary Palestinian workers as well who want to work in Israel to provide for their families? I, I would quote uh, the latest statement from the US State Department, uh, which came um, uh, last night where basically they're saying that uh, the policy of the last uh, uh, 30, 40 years has not promoted peace. Mm -hmm. We haven't gotten anywhere. We, we seem to be stuck in a, in a box. And I always made this case on this program and elsewhere to say that um, we have to think 
primarily about the quality of life, the well-being, the human rights, the dignity of the Palestinian people, mm. full stop. Mm. How do you achieve that? Do you achieve that by creating uh, uh, a state which may or may not be viable, where the human rights record already is, is very problematic, where there is um, incitement to hatred uh, throughout the education system, or, or are there other ways to, um, while we seek uh, a sustainable solution, to uh, uh, improve the living standards for the Palestinian people? And, um, and here I think, as exactly as you say, you know, when um, um, Israeli companies and industry provide job opportunities for, for Palestinians, I think this is a way to uh, create the conditions for peace. Because when, when, when people have jobs, when, when people have um, uh, good living standards, you know, this is where you can sit down and, and, and look at the uh, future together. And, and obviously, as we all know, um, when you look at the exports, say, I'm from Finland, we could never survive if we didn't have good relations with Sweden mm. and with Russia for that matter. So to think about the situation where you um, separate and isolate the Israelis from the Palestinians, it's not sustainable. Mm. And, and here I think the US peace proposal, what we do know about it is that it builds uh, a lot about business corporations, industrial zones. They are trying, we, we know for example now that when Soda Stream had to leave the territories, 600 Palestinians left, uh, lost their jobs. 25,000 Palestinians are dependent or, or the li livelihood is dependent on, on being employed by Israeli companies. The Americans would like to increase that number to, to 250,000 new jobs. And um, I think that we should look at ways of, of um, enabling this process, not making it difficult or, or complicated, or insinuate that, that it's a great obstacle to peace, uh, you know, to the extent that we need to label products that were, that were uh, uh, produced by Palestinians in, uh, or, or Jewish people living in, in the disputed territories. Yeah. And, um Caroline, I want to thank you for your brave uh, stand here in the European Parliament uh, against the rise of Jew hatred that we're seeing across Europe. Um, from your expertise, the BDS is one form of anti-Semitism to single out Israel, to yeah. delegitimise the Jewish state, um, and those supporters as well, because they don't do anything to help the Palestinians at all, and it's mainly Israel that comes under condemnation. So in your vast experience of dealing with dealing anti-Semitism at a government level, at a policy level, what policies do you believe that the European Union and the European Parliament can implement in order to eradicate this problem? I think a change is needed in the politics of the European Union towards Israel. Uh, coming from Austria, for me it's very clear to have a positive attitude to Israel. And also the European Union now has to understand that Israel is the only democratic state in that region. It is called the Middle East in English, but in, in German it's the Nahe Osten, it's very near, it's the Near East. Yeah? And if you're traveling three and a half hours, you're from Vienna in Israel, and then you have completely different circumstances regarding security. And that's what I would like, that people really feel and experience. So it would be great if more MAPs, members of the European Parliament, travel to Israel to experience the situation uh, at the region. I just came back from my last visit. It was, my, by the way, my second visit to Israel. And I learned again more about this country. And I learned also that, that the dispute between Palestinians and Israeli, uh, it's much more complicated than we can see from the outset. So I, I think it is too much if we say, OK, we know how you can uh, have a solution. We can bring people together. It's crucial that the two parties are again talking with each other and of course the policy of the European U Union is crucial. You can also support as a member of the European Parliament our working group on anti-Semitism mm -hmm. and regarding anti-Semitism the key is really education. Mm -hmm. You were also talking about mm -hmm. the Kristallnacht. So it's at the beginning of November. We call it November Programm in, in German now. But uh, we have to learn from the t that history and we have to change our policy. And my son, by the way, he's 18. He will join the military service in, in a few months. 
for half a year, but under completely different circumstances than Israeli young people are doing that, by the way, m men and women. Mm. So my wish is really that people go to Israel, experience, and that we can together support Israel mm. as a democratic state in the region, because Israel really deserves that. Absolutely. Sadly, we've run out of time, so thank you very much for a good program. And I just want to thank you for watching uh, today's uh, European report here in the European Parliament in the heart of the European Union. And in today's programme, we, we discussed the European Court's ruling on labelling uh, Israeli produce and goods produced from Judea and Samaria, or what the world says is the West Bank. And so therefore, it's imperative that one way that we can counter the BDS is by buying Israeli goods and products. So I want to thank you for watching today's European report.